good morning and welcome to part three of a series we've been doing called Faith Checklist. It started from this idea that lists are, are really at the core of everything we do, whether it's in an instruction booklet, whether it's a recipe, whether it's a how-to guide on the internet. Um, and without really adhering to those lists, things tend to just kind of fall apart, right? Think about it for a second. If you were building a house and somebody gave you a list of all the materials you needed and you went and you gathered half the things on that list and then threw the list away, what would happen to the house once you got it built? It would probably fall apart because you wouldn't have enough supports or you wouldn't have the right materials for the roof or any of those things, it would fall apart. So then we kind of started asking this question, okay, well if lists are at the core of everything we do, then it must also be at the core of our faith at our Christianity. So what happens when we apply a checklist to our Christian life? And we said that, well, one of two things will happen. Either we will become completely legalistic in our approach to our faith and our relationship with Jesus, or we'll begin to use it as a way to recognize each other. And in the very first week, we looked at a passage of scripture in Galatians chapter five, where we see the fact that we already have a list that we've been given, and it says this, is now the works of the flesh are evident, it's obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And then it goes on and even flips to the other side. It says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And they give us another list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there are no law. Paul gives us a list in the New Testament to give, to give us this idea of here's a checklist that you should really be following, and, and it helps us to define where we stand in relationship to God. It helps us to determine whether we're too far one way or, or a little too far the other way in some respects, and, and it gives us this ability to start recognizing someone who may be of the same mindset that we are, and it helps us to begin to measure our faith. This is the thing that I love about lists, is they help us to measure where we are in relation to where we want to be. Now, obviously, we said the first week, this isn't all the things that there are. It's not just the fruits of the Spirit. And so that's been the heartbeat of this series, is diving into some of those other things that are outside of that list of the fruits of the Spirit, of things that really there should be that maybe there aren't especially in the way in the world that we live in today. Some of these things we've talked about are, are must-haves. They're, they're non-negotiable. And some of them, they're just kind of like, okay, yeah, this should be there, but it's not going to alter your relationship with Jesus to the point to where you have no relationship with Jesus. And so the first week, we jumped in and we looked at a couple of different stories. We looked at the exodus with Moses and the people of Israel leaving Egypt. And the minute that they crossed the Red Sea, they began to worship God, even though they were in the middle of a wasteland. And then we jumped forward a little bit and we looked at David who was in the process of having his, his child die. And he fasted and, he, and he, he, he just wouldn't do anything. And then the child dies and he turns around and he worships God in the midst of the heartbreak of that. And then we jumped forward even further than that into the New Testament after Jesus had already been crucified and resurrected. And we see two men by the name of Paul and Silas who were in prison. And they're not just in prison, they're in the innermost parts of this prison where they're on the verge of a death sentence probably. And yet they still worship God in the midst of these circumstances. And we walked away from it, like I said earlier, with this idea and understanding that worship should not be dependent on our happiness. That if we only worship when we're happy, then we're giving a different picture of who God is because God isn't just God in the happy times. He's also God in the heartbreaking moments. And then last week, we, we kind of jumped into this idea and I asked you a question and it was this. It says, how do you want people to relate to you? How do you want them to remember you? What do you want them to walk away from an interaction with you knowing about you? And we jumped into it and we saw where Jesus kind of answered this question for us. In, in Matthew chapter 20, he says this, says, whoever would be first among you, you must be your slave. And he goes and he says this, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus lays out for us this plan of how he wanted people to relate to him and really to us because he set an example for us. And it's that he wanted to be a servant, 
of people. See, he was unique. We jump at something, we see an opportunity, and we, we want to fix what we think the biggest problem is instead of doing what Jesus did, and we tackle the things that are, have to be dealt with first before you can fix the big thing. He dealt with the heart of people. And he started building this picture for us of what service is supposed to look like. Service is a must in terms of evidence, okay? It's a must. It has to be there in order for people to look at us and understand whose we are. It won't save you. Working for Jesus, serving people does nothing to save you. It won't forgive your sins. It won't make you okay with God. In fact, the New Testament tells us that our works are like filthy rags to the Father. But it is still a must because it is evidence of what we say we believe. Because we can't have faith without service. And we walked away by saying this, that service should be a want to instead of a have to. We should, as believers, as, as Jesus followers, we should want people to see Jesus in us. And that is the driving force behind why we serve. Because everywhere people saw Jesus, Jesus was serving. Jesus was being the hands and feet of God, which sounds kind of odd to us because we see Jesus as being the son of God. But now I want to ask you another question before we jump in this morning, before we start really getting into the meat of this. How do you personally define weakness? If, someone, if I was to sit here and, and go one by one and have you out loud define what weakness is in a person, how would you define it? How would you begin to break away all the layers and say, well, for me, this is what weakness looks like? Probably for some of us, we would can't answer a lot of the ways that the world we live in answers. And it would be like, well, real men, they don't cry. That's a sign of weakness. Men aren't supposed to cry. If they cry, it shows they're weak. Or weakness is when somebody won't take a stand. Weakness is when somebody won't put their foot down and say, this is not okay. Or maybe it's weakness is, is when you just let people just do and do and do to you because we're told that you don't take anything from anybody. You just don't take it. You buck up, you fight back. Or, don't forgive the people who have betrayed you. Forgiveness is a sign of weakness. This is the norm in the world we live in. We live in a world where this is the definition of weakness, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're a child. If you forgive people, you're weak. If you, if you, if you, if you let people say their peace without coming back at them, it's a sign of weakness. If you cry as a man, it's a sign of weakness. In fact, some men will even tell their daughters, don't you cry because it will be seen as a sign of weakness. It's not weakness. Those things have nothing to do with weakness. By that very definition itself, real men don't cry. You, if you don't take a stand, you're weak. If you, if you take Everything somebody has to dish out and you don't dish it back, you're weak. If you forgive the people that betrayed you, you're weak. By that very definition, Jesus was the weakest human being to ever walk the face of the planet. Think about it. Jesus told people to turn the other cheek. And then he did it. Jesus went as far as weeping over the death of a friend. Jesus even went as far as not validating the stoning of a woman who was caught in adultery. He chose not to take a stand with other people. And then even as he was on the cross dying, he said these words, Father, Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. By the definition of the world we live in, Jesus was the weakest human being to ever walk the face of this earth. Because he did all of the things that we're told make someone weak. And as Christians, we should be mirroring this. 
in every aspect of our lives. But why? See, every bit of Jesus' life, he exercised compassion. He reached outside of himself and exercised compassion. Why? Because it reinforced why he came. Because the world that, that he lived in, people saw God as, as being vengeful and angry and spiteful and just wanting to watch the world burn when people didn't do what he wanted them to do. So Jesus had to exercise a different approach so that people would begin to see God for who he really was and not with their understanding of who God was. If Jesus had come in and, and approached life the same way that everybody expected of God, it would have made no difference. It wouldn't have pointed people closer to God. He had to break down the walls that separated mankind from God and his compassion tore those walls down and then fostered the ability for mankind us included, to have a relationship with the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the very God that we were made in his image, that breathed life into us. Jesus came and walked this earth so that we could hopefully begin to see in him and understand that compassion leads to relationship. Compassion leads to relationship. Let me explain. Jesus showed compassion to mankind. It led to the ability to have a relationship with him. Jesus exercised compassion with people he came in contact with. And it opened the door to relationships between people and Jesus in the flesh. Now here we are years and years and years later and the same thing still remains compassion leads to relationship between people and between us and God now I'm going to do something just a little bit different this morning okay I'm going to go through a ton of scripture and we're going to break it apart as we go through little by little I'm not going to throw out the verses to you because it will, you won't be able to keep up fast enough, okay? So I want you to really pay attention to what's on your screens. If you're online, watch the bottom third of your screen. If you're in the room with us, make sure you pay close attention to the screens, okay? I'll make sure that this week that if you want the references, come ask me for them. I'll give them to you so you can go back and look at them yourself. But after Jesus died and after Jesus was resurrected, people still began to struggle with this whole idea of having compassion with people because people still expected God to work a specific way. They still expected for, for God to interact a specific way with man, and they still expected men to interact with each other a certain way. And so even over the course of the early church being created, you began to see people who were Jews and beginning to see Gentiles who were not Jews coming in to this idea of being a Jesus follower and a Christian, and they, there began to be this infighting over what was supposed to happen. And there was absolutely zero compassion. And so the writers of the New Testament begin to pull away at this and begin to tear this down. A lot of what we're going to read today comes from Paul, because Paul, being, having been part of the Sanhedrin, who was in line to become one of the top guys in the religious court that Jesus rescued from that and said, Paul, you are missing the point. Why are you persecuting me? Paul begins to understand compassion from a completely different perspective. We're going to see stuff from Paul. We're going to jump in and see stuff from Peter. And then we're even going to take a look into what even some of what Jesus said. And so we're going to start off in the book of Colossians, and this is chapter 3. Okay, Paul is writing, he says, here there is not Greek and Jew. This division is gone. There's no Greek, no Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. But Christ is in all. And he works, he walks it forward. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He says, because all of these divisions are gone, because there's no more of this and this and this and this, there's no more race, there's no more poverty lines, there's no more definition, there's no more political parties, there's none of this stuff. 
There's no difference in culture. There's no anything. All of this is gone when it comes to Jesus. So because of that, put on. Take all of that off. Put something else on that people will recognize in you as God's chosen ones who are supposed to be holy and beloved. Put on so that people can see a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. But don't just stop there. That little word and, that little three-letter three word is a continuation. It says, do that. And if anyone has a complaint against you, forgive each other. Because just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. This is where compassion takes a break for people. We're willing to say, well, I'll be kind. I'll be gentle. I will, I will be compassionate towards some things. But, man, you cross me, boom, forgiveness is gone. When the reality is, is that every single one of us from the day we're born spit in God's face, and he still chooses to forgive us. But we walk away from this, and we pull away from it. Book of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul goes in. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord. Now, I'm telling you this because this is what God wants you to know. I'm testifying to you on God's behalf. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, I love this. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding. Their minds are dim. They're dull about the understandings. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. They're ignorant because of the hardness of their heart. It says they've become callous and have given themselves, I love this, given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way that you learned Christ. Do not walk. Like the Gentiles do. These people over here who have no understanding of who God is, who have no concept of who Jesus is, do not live your life their way. Give all of these things, put them aside, impurity, sensuality, greed, all of these things, push them aside because that is not the way that you learned Christ. This is a letter not being written to just basic people. This is a letter that is being written to Christians. This is a letter that is being written to people who know better. Paul says, that is not the way that you learned Christ. And he just had to give a little bit of an extra dig there, assuming that you've learned about him. Let that sink in for a second. Don't act this way because that is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you've actually learned anything about him. See, a lot of times as Christians, we want to say, oh, I know that. I do that. I know all about that. That's me. Paul's not dumb enough to assume that every single person that says they're a Christian is a Christian. And neither am I. And hopefully neither are you. Put all those things aside because that's not the way that you learned Christ, assuming that you've actually learned him. And we're taught in him because the truth is in Jesus. So put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. All of those things over there before you knew Jesus, they were part of your old self. Let your mind be renewed so that you can change the way you think about these things. Because when you think a certain way about certain things, you, that's what you put in to practice. So he says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self. All of these things over here that were the old part of who you were before Jesus, put those things away and put on something else that people will see. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Put on the new self that was created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And he goes on, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Get, let all of this, put all of this away, put all of these things away. And then, I love the way this is worded because it takes it a little bit different. It says, 
get rid of all of it. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. All of these things, your bitterness over not getting your way, the rage and anger you feel because somebody said the wrong thing to you, be done with it. Because this is not compassion. This is not what Jesus taught. This is not the heartbeat of the Father. Brawling, slander, saying things about people that aren't true, specifically for the purpose of tearing them down. Fighting amongst each other. Be done with it. Because all it does is divide and tear down and destroy. So if that's what we're supposed to put away, what are we supposed to do? Well, he continues and says this, be kind. Be kind to one another, compassionate. And then just like in Colossians, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Jesus exercised perfect compassion in the fact that he exercised grace in everything that we do. Philippians chapter 2, it kind of goes on and ties into this even more. It says, he says, therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. If you have ever experienced the grace that the Father has given you, then make my joy complete. Paul is talking to the people in this church that he's ministered to and he's worked with. And this is the cry of every pastor on the face of this planet. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, by understanding certain things, by having the same love, being, in, being one in spirit and of one mind. And he goes on and says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. We've heard this passage of scripture our entire lives. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but instead in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And not just that, but in your relationships, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. in the relationships you have. And he's not talking about the relationship with God, the relationship with Jesus. He's writing to believers. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This backs up what he just said a minute ago about with humility, consider others Well, how in the world is that supposed to back up the mindset of Jesus Christ? How is that supposed to back up what it looks like to be a Jesus follower? Well, it simply says this in the next verse, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, And then being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. This is hard for us. See, compassion cannot exist without humility. It can't. Because when you see somebody walking down the street or you see somebody that you work with or you see somebody in your own home, you've got to be able to look at that person and say, you know what, there's a possibility I've been in their shoes before. And the flip side of that, you know what, I've never been in their shoes before. I bet they're experiencing something I've never experienced. And I don't understand. But as human beings, we do not like to admit that we don't know or that we don't understand, especially as Jesus followers. We like to be able to look at a scenario and say, you know what, this is what Jesus would do, now do it. And that's the exact opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus didn't look at the people he came in contact with and say, you know what, you're a sinner, get rid of the sin. He looked at him and he said, you know what, I love you. 
Now let me help you with this, and then let's work on this. That was the heartbeat of the compassion that Jesus lived by. Even though he was God in the flesh and had command of every single thing in heaven, he humbled himself and became like us so that he could teach us what it looked like to show compassion. And he didn't just humble himself to becoming a servant. He, com- he, <laughs> he humbled himself as an eternal, infinite being to be able to become finite, to die, to have his life end. And not just to die, but to die something that really did not really need to happen to him. But yet we have a hard time looking at somebody and going, you know what? Maybe I should have used a little grace there. Maybe they deserve a little different response than what I want to give them. Maybe they deserve for me to take it just a little bit easier. So then what happened? Jesus humbles himself to the point of death on a cross. And then we see this, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We'll skip forward a couple verses and it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't just quit because I'm not there with you. Don't just quit working on this because nobody's watching. Don't just quit because the pastor's not watching. Don't just quit because other church people aren't around watching you. But continue to work out your salvation. Why? Because it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, he goes on and he says, do this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Do everything, not some things, not a thing, not many things, not the things you want to and the things that make you happy, the things that make you have joy. But he says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Do everything out of this. Think about it every single way you can. Well, that's hard. That's hard to do everything without grumbling and complaining and arguing. I mean, didn't you see what they said to me? Didn't they see, didn't, don't, didn't you see how they jumped in front of me in line? Didn't you see how they cut me off in traffic? Didn't you see how my kid back talked me and made me want to slap him in the next year? Didn't you see how the pastor said that thing and it made me feel this tall even though I know I was dealing with it. He was preaching at me. I promise you, no, I wasn't. So why is it such a big deal? Why in the world does, do, do they write in there, do everything without grumbling and complaining? Here's why. So that you may become blameless and pure. Think about it for a second. What does it look like to be blameless and pure in front of people's eyes? Well, blameless means without blame. I saw somebody recently share on on social media, they said, it's not always, you don't always have to tell your side of the story. Time will tell it for you. But what we like to do 
is when a moment arises where we feel like we've been wronged, we lash out. And then we become just as guilty as the person. Whether it's a police officer, whether it's a politician, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a deacon, whether it's a parent, whether it's a child, whether it's a teacher, no matter who it is, when we lash out, instead of exercising grace and compassion, we become as guilty as they are. And we are no longer seen as pure in the eyes of the people around us or in the eyes of the Father. Why? Because we've sinned. Ouch. In case you didn't know it, the Bible isn't always happy-go-lucky, make you feel good. Sometimes it makes you feel like dirt because you realize how truly far off of the mark you really are. Why is it such a big deal to become blameless and pure? Well, because we're supposed to be children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Over and over in the first part of this message, we saw where Paul said, do not walk in the ways the Gentiles walk. Don't walk in the same ways that the people who don't know God walk. Don't live like them. Renew your mind. Change the way you think. Change everything about who you are. Get rid of the old self. Put on the new self. Because we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to think different. We're supposed to act different. Talk different. Because we have a different mind because it is made in the image of Almighty God. The world we live in is warped. And I'm not talking just warped like a two-by-four you're trying to build a new house out of that's got a little bit of a bow in it. I'm talking about it looks like the letter S with 15 more curves in it. The world we live in is warped and crooked, and if we are not careful, we will begin to mimic it and match it to a point to where we will no longer be seen as blameless and pure children of God without fault. We exist on this earth as Jesus followers and believers to point people towards Jesus. But if we don't exercise grace and compassion in our lives with each other, with the people outside the building, then we cannot be this. Because when we do it, then we will shine among everyone like stars in the sky. You know what I love about this passage? What I love about this particular phrase when do you normally see stars? At night, when it's dark. One of the things that our, my, my kids, mine and Raquel's kids, learned in kindergarten is this, and I'm going to ask you guys this question too. And I'm hoping that at least one of my children will answer this correctly, because if not, we're going to go back and redo kindergarten again with them. Raquel's like, oh God, please answer. Do stars give off their own light? Some of them do. Think about the moon. Does the moon give off its own light? No, the moon does not give off its own light. It reflects the light of the sun. And a lot of the stars that we see are also reflecting the light of the sun. They don't emit their own light. Some of them do because they're gas giants like our sun. But even... Pluto, Saturn, Mars, other planets in the solar system that we look up and we see them as stars in the night sky, they are reflecting light from the sun. If we're going to shine among, if we're going to shine among the people in our world like stars in the sky, the only way we can do that is to actually be living in a world that is dark and warped and crooked and be reflecting the light of the Father. It's the only way. Jesus' followers cannot give off their own light. They reflect the light of the Father. 
And when we begin to exercise this and we begin to lean into this idea, we begin to reflect everything about Jesus through the compassion and grace that we show to the people around us, whether they're believers, whether they're not believers. We begin to see the same thing happen in our life that Jesus saw happen in his life. You begin to see people who are not Jesus followers wanting to be around you because they begin to see something different in you. They begin to understand, wow, they're different. Everything about who we are has to revolve around this idea of compassion and grace being exercised. And I'm going to be honest. There's not a lot of compassion exercised anywhere in our world right now. There's not. And unfortunately, that even penetrates into the church. I have seen online where pastors have been completely eviscerated by people in their churches because they didn't do what they wanted them to do. I've seen church leaders eviscerated by people because they didn't behave in a way that they wanted them to behave. I've seen people that in my own family who have been put on blast because they had a different opinion than somebody else. I've seen friends who have, call, who have called me and said, I don't know what to do because I'm afraid if I speak up on this particular thing to my boss, it's not going to go well. What scares me is that as Jesus followers, we are walking in a warped and crooked world. And our compassion for each other is rapidly disappearing. The compassion that we have for each other and for people around us that we're supposed to be pointing towards Jesus is rapidly disappearing. This is one of those things that, in my opinion, is a must for Jesus followers. Why? Because we're not like everyone else. Compassion will not save you. Showing compassion to people in your life will not, will not by any means give you a ticket to heaven. But it will evidence to people that you belong to Jesus. And it will pave the way for relationships to thrive because compassion leads to relationships. When we begin to exercise compassion, people see Jesus. When we exercise compassion with people in the church, Jesus is pleased. And we begin to grow as Christ followers, as a family, as a tribe, as a body. And the relationships between each of us begin to strengthen, binding us together in a way that we never really thought we needed. When we exercise compassion outside the church, it fosters relationships with people who need to see Jesus. And it opens the door for us to be able to speak into his life, or their lives, I should say, the way that Jesus was able to speak into the lives of the people that he showed compassion to. In your life right now, where do you need to exert compassion? Where do you need to humble yourself and step back and take a look and say, you know what, I may have blown this out of proportion. My thought process may be off a little bit here. Because when you do, when you begin to exercise compassion, the relationships you have will grow stronger and will draw you closer to the Father.
Father, thank you so much that even when we didn't deserve it, you still showed us compassion and sent your son to die for us. My prayer this morning is that every single one of us in this room will do the hard thing and humble ourselves and ask the question, where in my life do I need to show compassion? Father, I pray that you'll give us your eyes to see people the way that you see them. Give us your heart to understand what they're going through. And help us to be what they need so that we can love them the way that you do and draw them closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.